States, he was of African descent. His name was Langston Hughes. He wrote a great poem called The Negro Speaks of Rivers. And he wrote, I've known rivers, ancient dusky rivers, as old as the flow of human blood in human veins. He wrote, I bathed in the Euphrates when dawns were young. I built my hut along the Congo, and it lulled me to sleep. And I gazed upon the Nile and raised the mighty pyramids above it. I saw old Abe Lincoln when he went down to New Orleans, and I watched the Mississippi and saw its muddy bosom turn all golden in the sunset. I've known rivers, he wrote, the ancient dusky rivers my soul has grown deep like the rivers. And then in the Bible, in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in the eighth chapter, somewhere beginning around the 26th verse, there is a story about one of the apostles after the death and resurrection of Jesus. His name was Philip. And after all the controversy around that, Philip was told by an angel to go south. And as he was traveling south, the Bible says he came upon an Ethiopian eunuch. Whoever put that on, man, I feel sorry for him. An Ethiopian eunuch. And several things were said about this. He said that when Philip approached his chariot, now the first thing to note is that he was riding in a chariot. That means he was a man of some distinction because everybody else would be walking. The second thing to note is that the Bible points out that he was the treasurer of Candace, who was the queen of Ethiopia. And that's important because he was the treasurer. He was a man of some skill handling money. And the third thing to note is the book says that he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the key thing there is that he was reading. So he was a man of some means, who handled money well, who was reading, riding in a chariot, and he came across one of the apostles. Of course, the story goes on to say that he was baptized. But right away, beloved, if you understand who I am as an African in America, you will see that many of the myths that have been portrayed about us were dispelled by this Ethiopian eunuch. Reading, counting, riding, and a representative of a queen. And so what I'm suggesting to you is that that knowledge of Africa alone is reason enough to draw faith-based people to want to see what is an Ethiopian. But it goes back further than that, of course. It goes back to Sheba going to visit Solomon. And it also embraces the notion that not only did Ethiopia embrace Judaism, but it is the oldest Christian nation in the world. <clears throat> Much further advanced than the United States of America, thank God. The oldest Christian nation in the world. Long before Charlemagne, the oldest Christian nation in the world, before Constantinople, once Byzantium, now Istanbul, the oldest Christian nation in the world. And the other thing that I want to speak to you about is that when we think of rivers, let's focus on the Nile for a moment. We are the Abyssinian Baptist Church in the city of New York. Abyssinian is named for Ethiopia. We were acknowledged by the line of Judah, as he was called then, Haile Selassie, who came to visit Adam Clayton Powell, Jr., who, by the way, was the only congressman to attend the Bangkok Conference in the 1950s when the so-called emerging nations were coming up, an African-American clergyman 
who happened to become a congressperson, who recognized the importance of Africa, embraced Nkrumah early on. This is reason enough for people in the faith community to want to visit Africa. And so as I talk about the black church in this, in this conversation about why we should want to travel, we as the Abyssinian church named for Ethiopia. But then remember now, the Africans in America, when they built the churches, and that's another conversation altogether about the importance of the church in our community. The early churches were named for Africa. Abyssinian, the African Methodist Episcopal Church, the African Methodist Episcopal Zion Church, the first African Baptist Church. Oh, Africa, my Africa, if I forget thee. These are reasons why we want to go to see what we missed. I know rivers. The Abyssinian church named for Africa in the celebration of our 200th anniversary made a pilgrimage to the Holy Land, Ethiopia. Ethiopia is our Holy Land. And when we got there, we were amazed by what early Christianity had brought that we didn't even know. We saw the churches hewn from stone. We learned that the Ark of the Covenant is there, or so they say. I said, well, can I see it? They said, well, you can see it if you replace the monk that's in there guarding it. I said, well, what does that mean? So that monk has to stay there all the days of his life. So I said, I'll take your word for it. <laughs> we found out so much as we traveled through Gondor, as we went to Aksu, as we dwell in Addis Ababa and realize that the only way that Muslims could be alive today was that Muhammad, peace be upon him, found refuge in Ethiopia when he was persecuted by the rest of the world. We have no reason to fear Muslims. We have every reason to embrace them because we, among all others, realize that Abraham is the father of us all in a manner of speaking, taking nothing away from this. <laughs> and so therefore, while we were there, we discovered so much. But what we discovered in a very ruling height, I gazed upon the Nile, is one of the origins of the Nile, the Blue Nile. And we saw the magnificent fall. And I can't tell you that after seeing the churches, after seeing the church where the Ark of the Covenant is, after going to the island in Lake Tana, and visiting and seeing the ancient Christian writings, watching the monks, looking at the Amharic, and for many of us it was like reading Chinese, we didn't know it. But many lives were transformed. Many people came into a greater understanding, not only of our faith and our religious experience. And that's why I like when the gentleman said that, 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 that you have to emphasize travel for the, what did he call it, the aspirational and the experiential travel. Because the journey was not always easy. But it was so transformative, so enlightening. We took 165 people to Ethiopia. We left over two and a half million dollars there, not counting what we spent for travel. We are the largest single delegation ever to visit the nation. We took 110 people to Ghana. That in itself was so moving, and the Ghanaians were so warm and welcoming. I must admit that only four of us went to Kenya. But we went on safari. We traveled the country. We danced with the Messiah. All of these things are attractive 
The Blue Nile was attractive because Dr. Ben Yunkinen, who is in New York, told us that the major world religions found their root in Africa. Well, when you see the Blue Nile, you begin to understand that it originates, yes, down south. It flows north. Another wonderful thing to know. And that the culture that travels along, I've known rivers, has moved from Uganda, from Tanzania, has moved up and found its following possibly in Egypt. But it was not Egyptian purely. It had its roots further south. Who is it that lives in Uganda? What are the roots there? What else will we discover? John S. Mbiti, one of the foremost uh, scholars of the Christian faith, Kenyan by birth. What will we discover? What lies have we been told? What truths will be revealed? These kinds of propositions placed before a faith-based community, particularly in the African experience in America, will open our eyes and cause more and more of us to go. It's not just about seeing the slave castles and seeing the doors of no return. It's about getting right down to the very root of civilization. God is there all over the country. Another thing about it was we had said that when we were going to start this trip, we would go to uh, Ethiopia first, and then we stay there for a while, and then go down to South Africa, and then return home. And when the people suggested that, I had to remind, I said, do you know how large Africa is? <laughs> and understandably, beloved, many of them had no idea. So I had to explain, well, if you take the, you know, you can't look at the maps and figure anything out. But if you take the map of the United States that you see, you can fit that continental United States of America into the continent of Africa three times. They said, oh. <laughs> and especially, please note that the airfare would have just broken all of us. We could. But it was possible. Now people are dying and hungry to go back. They want more. They want more. And to those of you who, who know of the accommodations, uh, you know, the experiential and the aspirational travel. Because many African Americans have embraced Western ways and some of the creature comforts that we enjoy at the Hilton, we expect to find everywhere in the world. That's not necessarily the case. And so many people are willing to go back and they learn because they were hungry. Lives were transformed. I have people coming to church now who didn't come before they went on that trip. And the other thing is, at least one person has started two businesses in Ethiopia and taken advantage of the economic opportunities. You want a good spokesperson for faith-based travel in the African continent? Talk to me. Because now I'm beginning to understand what Langston meant when he said, I have no rivers. I'm beginning to understand what I have missed. I'm beginning to understand truths that have been hidden. While we were in Ethiopia, we went to visit the uh, headquarters of the African Union. And uh, Excellency, I hope you forgive me, but there was no meeting there at the time, so all the seats were vacant. And I just parked myself in the high seat and just sat there. <laughs> and imagine what you must have before you when you have all the leaders gathered. What power. We had to learn that Ethiopia, well, we knew some of us knew this, had never been colonized. And it was the faith of the people that kept them strong. So dearly beloved, there's a community out there that's dying to learn more and more about much has been made recently of a new movie, 42, Jackie Robinson. Isn't it amazing that his sons, I don't know if he's still in Tanzania, with the coffin, he was there, David. What a marvelous thing. There's so much to learn. So I'm excited to be with you. 
I don't know if anything that I've said has uh, piqued your imagination or given you anything to work with. But uh, while I was there, by the way, uh, in every part of Africa, by the way, that I've been to, I've been to a lot of different countries, it was not just the African American who was there. There were religious leaders from Germany, Religious leaders from all over Europe. I remember the Germans because they were the largest number at the time. All over Europe, anxious to know about the early roots of Christianity. And make no mistake, during the terrible drought in the Sahel and in Ethiopia, the Jewish community flew in and got the Colossians and flew them out. Why? Because there's an important link to Judaism in Africa. And always remember that in the depths of trouble, whether it was Joseph or whether it was the Joseph with Mary and Jesus, when you're faced with trouble, you go to Africa. And Muhammad knew that. And you stay in Africa for a while until the trouble that passes over. <laughs> then you go back. Isn't that amazing? Now, I don't think I've said anything that's inconsistent or wrong. I'm just trying to show you what wealth and treasure lies in the continent and why it's important for all of us to know. And so as a leader in the faith-based community, quote, unquote, I am very pleased to be with you this morning. I'm very pleased to hear my panelists speak the way they have about the opportunity that's there. And I pray to God that I would only have enough time to continue to spread the news and to work with Mr. Bergman to get more and more people to go to Africa and prayerfully be transformed in ways that will transform the world. Thank you, and God bless you.